I remember I interviewed Scarface uh, this one time, and uh, he had songs about suicide, and he talked about suicide. And I remember I asked him about it. I said, uh, what are your thoughts about suicide? And he looked at me and said, well, it's never too late to quit. We talked about the whole suicide thing. And you said, and I'm, I'm always going to remember this, you said, it's never too late to quit. If you ever get tired of it, man, it's, 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 not, too, it's, it's not too late to quit. <laughs> you can always quit. If you get too tired of this shit, you can always quit. And he said it's so cold <laughs> that I just felt it in my soul. He said it's never too late to quit. You could always quit. And, uh... Yeah, it's it's very uh, it's a very dark place to be in. Between being addicted to drugs and selling drugs, and going through your mental uh, illness at the time and and everything else like that, what do you think was the absolute worst experience of that time? Sleeping in a park, going through withdrawal, sleeping in a park, homeless, and and every bridge that I had was burnt. Besides my using friends and some clientele, well, I, I'll, I'll never forget that. Like sitting in the fucking slide and just being like seeing it in movies growing up, like us being homeless, you know, all this stuff. Never, you know. But when you're actually there and you're there because of your own choices, that's that's it hit me. It fucked me up. Um, however, I that wasn't the wake up call because I continued using for for a good probably year after that. But that was definitely something that I, I feel like was rock bottom for me. Yeah, homelessness is a... Uh, when you're at the point where you have to sleep in a park, you've pretty much exhausted every other option in life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you go through all this, and then at 19, you decide to move to Los Angeles. Yes. Okay, were you still an addict at that point? I, I was. <laughs> I was an addict that thought that switching locations was going to save me. And boy, was I wrong. I, uh, yeah. Yeah, L.A. is not really the best place for a recovering addict. It's not, but it's a good place to try and become a rapper. And I okay. thought that in my head. I was like, yo, like, fuck it. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. So you show up to L.A., and where were you with the music at that point? I was, I had a dream, and I had some, I had some songs written on some notepads. That was about it. Nothing, nothing. basically. I was nothing. Okay. So what point did the music actually start to develop? Started to develop. So I started, I mean, I started, my first studio I ever went to was was here in California. And uh, I had no fan base then. I just, so I made a little mixtape, put it on Dapiff and uh, let it ride. Didn't do shit. Um, the first time I, like, I started making money off my music was after my Black Snow album. And uh, that was just uh, more because of local support from back home. You know, oh, you moved out to California, oh, he's popping, you know, so they, they, they showed a lot of support then. Um, but I didn't see, start seeing actually like a fan base grow until I came out with my song Magic. That's when the blog started picking it up and and uh, all that. And then uh, the most recent success has been uh, That's All when it went viral on TikTok. And, you know, that's, I'm still riding that wave. So That's All came out about a year ago? Yeah, almost almost two. Okay, almost two years ago, and that's at five million views right now. Fact. Which is a that's a that's a big chunk right there. Mm -hmm. It's a big accomplishment. A lot of artists never make it to even attempt that. Right. And it's a very dark song. And that was really like your thing to create kind of dark, you know, yeah, hardcore type music. Mm -hmm. I. I've always, like I said, I've always taken interest in the darker things in life. I mean, my, I when I was when I was upset, mad, sad, whatever. When I was younger, even when I was a kid, I wouldn't go watch a happy comedy movie. When I would get home from school after getting in a fight or or something, I'd come home and I would watch a horror movie because that was the best way for me to release my demons and all my bullshit was to get it out watching some fucking sad, sadistic shit. And so, when I started writing poetry before the music to try and get my thoughts out. Um, there, it was very violent stories I was creating. It was, it was a lot of, uh, a lot of negativity through my, through my poetry. And eventually I turned that into, into lyrics, which turned into music and yada, yada. So 
Um, it's always been my, 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 my lyrics have always been very, very dark. Um, to me, they're not dark to me. That's just me because I've always felt this way and I've always, you know, this has always just been me. But when I finally came out to the world with it, um, people are like, yeah, man, this is pretty fucked. Um, right. And there's been, I mean, horrorcore has been a thing in hip hop. I mean, the grave diggers, probably one of the early groups, um, there, there's been a number of people that have played around with that, but none of it's really blown up. And that's the, that, and that's what I'm changing. I'm bringing, I'm bringing this to to the mainstream world. I, I feel like ICP and 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 Twisted and all these guys, that, although they're legends, I never grew up. Li- I didn't listen to that stuff. I I didn't listen to horrorcore when I was growing up. I, my my idols are Lil Wayne, Gucci. You know, those are those are the what I, I listen to trap music. But but to me. Because the, the the horror core, it's always been kind of that's kind of corny to me. I just they never they never gave me chills on the back of my neck. They I felt what what they were they were more of a gimmick than anything, and that's no disrespect, but I just I to me I want to bring something different to horror core. I want to bring a new a new light to horror core, and 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 I, and I believe that we're doing that. Yeah, I mean Three Six Mafia, they named themselves after the devil pretty much, mm-hmm. <laughs> and they had quite a bit of. Uh you know, gory type music, but it was really more like lighthearted at the end of the day. Like you didn't really think that these guys were really chopping up bodies or they weren't really selling it, you know, in that way. And they started to kind of progress out of that as they became more successful. But you kind of, you know, base yourself off more of like a Marilyn Manson type. They say that, yeah, the source put me as the Marilyn Manson of hip hop. And I was, right. I was like, I mean, that's an honor. He's a legend. Yeah. Have you been to his shows? I have not, never. Oh, I went to one of his shows. It's it's a real production. I mean, it's like crazy. He comes out with these stilts and like oh. crazy outfits. And I remember like I went to this one show and he was saying how he's like, Jesus Christ told me to do drugs. And then from the back of the stage, literally the length of the whole stage, this giant sign, like a Vegas sign came up that said drugs. Like it was like a twenty foot high, forty foot long sign that said That's... drugs that you know was flashing the lights. Uh-huh. Like he really went all out. Uh-huh. <laughs> there, there was no holes barred in terms of. I love it. I love that. You know, and then then you had like a uh, Guar. Hmm. Uh, am I pronouncing it right? Is it Guar? Hold on. Oh, they actually dress like. Hold on. I'm unfamiliar. Yeah, Guar. These guys wore these giant outfits, dressed like big monsters. Oh shit! I just, I just, yeah, I just seen something on them. Actually, yeah. I, I thought that was like some Mortal Kombat shit. I didn't know what yeah, I was looking yeah, at. They're, they're, they're real. That's crazy. And that's just not like a, that's not like a Slipknot mask. That's like a whole ass outfit. Like they got the whole, the whole thing. Oh yeah, no, they're, 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 uh, they're serious with that shit. <laughs> okay, so you move to LA, you start doing music, and the music starts to pick up. And now you're getting paid shows, making some income off of streams and so forth. Uh, but it's not like all your other problems just go away with that. The money's nice, but you still have to live with yourself after everyone leaves the room. What changed after the music started to, started to actually move, but you still have to deal with all your, your uh, other issues? The music, the music has saved my life. I, I once went, I don't know. It's like when you break up with your girlfriend, right? And, or you guys break up and you're all sad and shit. But then a new girl comes along and you fall fucking madly in love with her. The, suddenly your ex is kind of fading out of your memory. That's kind of what happened with my, my love with, with, with drugs. I was in love with drugs. I loved drugs. But when I, my music started doing what I, I always dreamt of it doing, suddenly that became my main focus. So I, I owe a big thanks to, to this music and my fans because they, they, they technically saved my life. Because if it wasn't for that shit, I would I guarantee you I'd be fucking dead. And that's just... That's deep. That's very deep. And, you know, based on your background, uh, I mean, I believe it. I believe it because you've actually been in and out of mental institutions. You've wore straight jackets. 
think you were given fentanyl at one point. It was Haldol. What's that? It's like a horse tranquilizer. Oof. I put me out for like a day and a half. Like a special, like special K kind of. Yeah. Don't you exactly. hallucinate off special K? I'm not sure. Oh, I've never done it. Yeah. But I know this shit put me out for like a day and a half. And I had no memory of even walking into that institution. Because uh, I was in rehab and I got in a huge fight and flipped out and did a bunch of shit there. So that I got arrested. And I remember sitting in the corner of the rehab surrounded by cops and they handcuffed me and they were talking to me. And that's the last memory I have with what happened. I woke up in a mental institution in Illinois and I, my, the roommate that I had um, was just like laughing and telling me the story about what happened. So I was swinging at security guards. I was spitting on nurses, all this shit, you know, telling nurses I'll rape you. I'll just outrageous shit. And mm. I have no memory of this, none. And apparently they, they, they put a spit mask on me and shot me in the ass with hell doll. Like one of those Hannibal Lecter kind of masks? No, it's like a net. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no. <laughs> That'd be, hey. <laughs> That'd be kind of cool looking. This is like an album cover right there. Yeah, exactly. No. Uh, okay. When you look at where hip hop is today, and it started out with the drug dealers, these days you have more drug users than drug dealers. You have situations like Lil Peep who died uh, from a fentanyl overdose, I believe. Uh, you have, um, what was his name? Uh, you have Fredo Santana, who became ad addicted to lean, ended up having uh, kidney failure, and ultimately died at like, I think 27 years old. When you see this type of thing, People glamorizing drugs, talking about how much all the lean they drink, all the pills that they pop. As someone who is a, a recovering addict, how does that make you feel? I just, I feel for them. I mean, if that's all they're doing, that's all they know, that's all they're going to talk about. When I was, when I was involved, that's all I talked about was money, drugs. That's it. I mean, that's, if that's what your life is, that's what you're going to talk about. The reason I talk about things I talk about is because I'm battling demons in my head every fucking day. So I, I, I mean, I, I feel for them, and I, and I, and I hope that you know. It seems like even with the, the fame and the music, it, that that can't save them. You know, for instance, Mac and all them. Mac Miller is another one. Yeah. There you go. And, and uh, we make our own choices. We make our own choices. You know, and uh, <laughs> yeah, they got to figure it out. I mean, I've been in hip hop. Since since the eighties, I don't remember this many drug overdoses. This is more like a rock and roll thing. Mm. I mean, you see like the guys in like Motley Crue having ODs and yeah. th that type of thing. Yeah. The glam metal guys are the ones who are who are overdosing. Hip hop guys were smoking weed. You know, even if they did coke, it was never talked about or glamorized, and you never saw guys just dying. But now you literally every year now you have a handful of people that die from drugs usually pills now it's not it's not about the the heroin and the, and the cocaine and the crack anymore it's really about the prescription pills that are just flooding the streets why do you think that is uh i honestly don't know man i'm not a drug guy like that you know i've done i smoke weed but you know i've never done cocaine or heroin or crack uh you know i've done ecstasy a couple times i've done mushrooms but i'm not like a hardcore drug guy so i don't think i'm the one that really could answer a question like that i think that's more but from like outside looking in like you said you've never been in that position do you think it's because of the music and the, it's being glorified so these kids are starting to not be as scared to to try these things or do you think it's yeah. millennials are more fuck you i'm gonna do what i want yeah it's hard to say it's hard to say, but clearly, you know, I'll, I'll tell you this, uh, growing up in high school, where I was growing up, weed was not considered a cool thing. You were kind of a loser if you smoked weed when you were in high school. And then Cypress Hill came out, and suddenly it was cool to smoke weed. I mean, because even if you go back a couple of years before Cypress Hill, Dr. Dre was rapping that he doesn't smoke weed because it gives you brain damage. 
you know, a song called Express Yourself. I mm. don't I don't smoke weed or cess because that's known to give a brother brain damage. A brain damage on the mic don't manage nothing but making a sucker and you equal don't be a sequel. And then he comes out with an album called The Chronic and his face on a zigzag cover. That was after Cypress Hill. Cypress Hill created a stigma around marijuana that made it cool, made it acceptable. You weren't a loser or, you know, broke or whatever when you smoked weed. And when you fast forward to 2019, going into 2020, people are talking about popping pills. People have been talking about drinking lean. And I've, I, I saw Pimp C a week before he overdosed and died from, from a lean overdose. Uh, that, that didn't stop a thousand other rappers having double cups in their video and, <laughs> you know, drinking it nonstop. It, it's messed up. But, it, but you just answered it. it yeah. it's, it's, it has to do with the, the media. Yeah. When one person does lean then and talks and glorifies it, these kids are going to be like, oh, well, I wonder what the, damn, what what's what's the like? hype about it. Yeah, and when you say heroin is the best thing I've ever tried and it was better than sex, I'm sure some people are going to be like, oh, shit. Don't do heroin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean... Uh, it ruined my fucking life, man. That shit, you know. It, you got to be honest, though. I mean, it, I, I'm going to lie and say, oh, no, it was the worst feeling in the world. That's why I did it every day. Right. <laughs> like, no. So what happens these days? Let's just say someone came in and, and pulled out their little drug kit and started doing drugs in front of you and asked you if you wanted some. Nothing. Nothing? Doesn't even face me. You're totally over it. Coke a little bit. Somebody Coke works, a little bit? Somebody bumps out, throws out a couple bumps or something. <laughs> I'm going to okay. get the little shit. I shivers that. a little bit. But, but with heroin, hell no, man. Because I, I, know, I know that shit's going to kill me if I touch it again. I know it's going to. Because yeah. it's, it's just my body and heroin. Are... Doesn't go together. I got you. So what's next for you? Tour. Um, just dropping music. I'm, I, I'm just going to, this my entire 2020 is my goal is just to flood my fans with music. I just want to give them so much fucking music, man. I, I feel like we're in a day and age where there's no rules anymore. There's no, you don't have to drop an album and then drop a single and then drop the video. for You can do whatever the fuck you want. And, and I feel like with the power of the internet and streaming nowadays, I just feel like more is better. Um, you know, I, I, I just go back, you know, I'm a fan of music and I go back to when I was, you know, a kid and I wish my favorite artist would drop a new song every week or every month on a consistent basis. And I just want to give that to my fans. I, I think they deserve it, you know, because like I said, they they saved my life, man. So I owe them everything. So whatever I can do to make them happy, I'm going to do it. So lots of new music. Well, Skits, I appreciate you coming in and sharing your story. I think this is something that a lot of people can not only relate to but are going through and to speak about it so candidly and admit to you know not too many people would admit to smoking crack right you know regardless of whether they did it or not not too many people would admit to taking heroin people admit to popping pills and doing molly and all that you know smoking weed and everything else because that's kind of more socially acceptable not to say that it's not as bad as <laughs> as everything else because you know you i've heard horror stories about xanax and and stuff like that but the fact that you could actually share your story i think will really have people watch and kind of rethink a lot of their choices because uh it is it, it's something like for example um i just interviewed flavor Flav, who has had a a problem with drugs his whole life. And he says something, says something very interesting. And I may be getting the, the, the time frame a little bit wrong, but whatever. And he said that he had done drugs for, I believe it was like 15 years. And he had been sober for 10. But he feels to really get out of it, he has to be sober for another five because as long as it takes you to get into it, you have to spend that same amount of time getting out of 100%. it. 100%. I was fucked up off of that shit for 18 years. So that means you're going through a dark ass tunnel for 18 years. Now, in order for you to get out of that tunnel, you got to turn around and come back 18 years. 
Mm. The same distance that it takes you to go there, it's going to take you that same amount of time for you to get back. You know what I'm saying? So now I've been clean off of coke and crack now for about a good eight, eight and a half years. I still got another 10 to go before I could be back to where I was. So right now to this day, yes, addiction can still set into me. You can relate that's to that? A good, that's a good way to say it, though. Yeah. That man, no, he's speaking facts. That's that's pretty good. I'd agree, yeah. I mean, he, he's he he's been doing that longer than me. I yeah. wasn't in it that long, but... Yeah, he's I, 60. <laughs> God damn. Yeah. yeah, still looks good, by the way. <laughs> looks healthy, you know? Yeah. Like, looks great for 60. But yeah, he, he, he said that, and it was like, wow, that's a very interesting way of looking at it. And as someone who's gone through it, you agree. Yep. I, I, the re, you know, you, you say you, you, you give me a, an applause for being so honest. I mean, I, to me, that's all I, I feel like why, why bullshit? Like I, if I can help, I know there's going to be people watching this because I have people, kids tell me every day, like how my interviews or my, my music saves their life and stuff. And, and, you know, it, people might say, oh, well, you're, like you said, um, talking about this and saying it's better than sex might make these kids want to do it. Well, I, I hope they, before they just listen to some random guy in an interview, I hope they l like learn about my music and listen to my music so they can get the whole story and they'll be like, damn, actually, you know what? I'm good on that. Yeah. And and that's my that's my whole thing, man. These, these kids need help. And and my music is very negative, but I reach people through it in a dark way, positively in a dark way. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm doing this. People, I, I have parents that DM me and shit say, oh, I just caught my son listening to your music. How dare you talk about the things you do and shit. But then their son's coming back around and saying how helpful I am yeah. and that their parents don't understand. Like, that's why I'm here, man. So I, I get it. I make negative music. I'm very honest about things. Maybe I should maybe sugarcoat, but that's just not me. I wouldn't feel like I'm doing like... I don't know. I don't want to be a character. I don't want to be a make believe. I want to be me. I want to be me all the time. And that's that's why I'm very open about my mental illness and very open about my drug addiction because I feel like there's 20,000 bazillion quadrillion people that are going through the same shit I'm going through and have gone through and they they need that help. You know, I wish Lil Wayne would be when I was growing up. I wish he would talk to me. Like if he if Lil Wayne fucking was talking about mental illness when I was going through that shit, you know how much that would help me? And that's, you know, I want to be that for these kids, bro. Like, yeah. if I can, you know, so. I think uh, XXXTentacion kind of broke the barrier yeah. in terms of talking about depression mm. and feelings and yep. stuff like that. Because hip-hop was historically just very cool. Nothing bothers you. I walk, I can walk off anything. Uh, I'm never sad. I'm never lonely. Uh, I never go through anything. I'm, I'm always great. Mm. I'm good. I'm making money. I got girls. <laughs> Life's good. Life is always good. Life is a, a, a nonstop music video. Uh -huh. In reality, someone like an XXX and Tassion came and said, nah, I'm, I'm fucked up. I'm depressed. I, I have a bad relationship with my girlfriend. You know, it, it's, it's one of those things that I think a lot of people connected to. You know, rest in peace, XXX and yeah. Tassion. Well, Skits Craven, appreciate you coming in and uh, sharing your story, man. And just keep keep grinding. It seems like you have a real fan base. You have, you know, outside of, um, you know, that's all. There's a bunch of songs that are in the million plus. You know, from Bad Temper to Bad Guy uh, to Mr. Roger. You know, you put out a bunch of music that people have connected to. I think that's a that's a very big deal. So congratulations and just. Keep on pushing on. Thank you, bro. I appreciate you. No doubt. Peace.